This video is about the most important broad lines for the management of psoriatic arthritis and skin psoriasis. I'm Dr. Hatem al Aishi, professor of rheumatology at Cairo University in Egypt. And what we provide here is a series of videos for patient education about the different types of arthritis. For management purposes, we divide psoriasis-related disorders into three big entities. The musculoskeletal entity, which we call psoriatic arthritis, and that is managed by the rheumatologist. The dermatological entity, which can be psoriasis of the skin or the scalp or the nails, and these are managed by the dermatologist. And the associated comorbidities entity, which mostly comprises high blood cholesterol and high blood pressure that associate with severe intense psoriatic arthritis or severe skin psoriasis. And they are managed by the internist or the general practitioner. Since eye inflammation is not a common problem in this disease, so we will not give it much space here. If it happens, management will be coordinated between the rheumatologist and the ophthalmologist. So we are here to discuss the first three big entities. Once we define which entities are affected in a given patient, you don't have to have all three entities. You can have one only or, can have, or you can have two only. The next step will be breaking down each entity into its smaller components and assessing the extent of affection and inflammation in each of those components. And I will explain what I mean. For example, if you have psoriatic arthritis, that is you have an affection in the structures of your, of your musculoskeletal system, we need to define where exactly is your affection among the structures of your musculoskeletal system. Is it inflammation of the peripheral joints, like joints of the hands and feet and ankles and knees? Or is it inflammation of the tendons, mostly, we call this tenosynovitis? Or is it inflammation of those parts of the tendons that attach to the bones? We call this enthesitis. Or is it inflammation or affection of the joints of the spine and the sacroiliac joints in the back of the pelvis? We call this spondylitis and sacroiliitis. And why do we need to make that level of distinction? Because when we prescribe a treatment plan, what is good for inflammation of one structure might not always be good for another. For example, inflammation of the joints of the hands and feet can respond nicely to a class of medications that we call non-biologic disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs or non-biologic demards. And only if one or more of the medications from that class fail due to side effects or due to failure to control this inflammation, do we proceed to substituting or adding uh, to our prescription, a medication from the more powerful class of medications that we call biologic demands. Please refer to my two videos about those two classes of medications for more information. I will leave the links in the comments below. On the other hand, if we document that your inflammation is mostly not in the peripheral joints of the hands and feet, but rather in the spine, the non-biologic demards have no place here from the start, and it is only biologic demards that are really effective. So, here, if anti-inflammation painkillers do not work for a mild spine affection, we skip the step of trying a non-biologic demand and we proceed straight away to the more powerful biologic demands. This is an example of how the process goes. So, what if a patient has inflammation both in the peripheral joints and in the spine at the same time? Most likely, we skip the non-biologic demand step as this is as this is of no use for the spine and we will still proceed to the biologic demands that should control the spine and of course also the, also the peripheral joints. It is exceptional that you, will that you will have a patient who will require a biologic demand that works so nicely for the spine but that uh, does not work really good for the peripheral joints in which case we combine a non-biologic demand for the peripheral joints. So, as you can see, the final management decisions will be related or dictated by where the main affection happens and how severe that affection is. Now, the second entity, skin. 
How about if you have psoriasis of the skin or the scalp or the nails? Here the dermatologist will decide mostly at the start on topical treatments, creams and emollients, maybe also PUVA, ultraviolet light therapy. If inflammation however is so intense or if psoriasis do not respond, the dermatologist will proceed to non-biologic demands. And if medications from that family are not enough to control the skin disease, he will lastly proceed to biologic demands. Communication and collaboration between the rheumatologist and the dermatologist, as you can see, is very important in the management of psoriatic disorders because we sometimes need to coordinate management of the skin entity and the musculoskeletal entity together. It is very important to note here that when we prescribe non-biologic demands for inflammation of the musculoskeletal system or for the skin, there are some medications that are so good for both entities, like methotrexate, for example. There are some medications that are known to be good and effective for the joints, but not really for the skin, like salazopyrin or liflunamide. I'm using the scientific names here, by the way, as the trade names are different in different countries. And there are some medications that are so popular for the skin affection, but that are not as effective for the joint affection, like cyclosporin, for example. All this makes a good communication between the rheumatologist and the dermatologist more and more important, of course. Regarding the entity of the high blood cholesterol and the high blood pressure that associate with psoriasis diseases, this is more likely to be under control or to be even prevented by good treatment of the first two entities, the skin and the musculoskeletal entities. If we control them, we can save patients a lot of trouble and prevent the development of atherosclerosis of the blood vessels over the long run. In all cases, treatment of any entity should be started as early as possible. The earlier, the better the outcome always. When discussing management of psoriatic arthritis and skin psoriasis, we should not, of course, ignore the important role of patient education, instructions for lifestyle modification, and physical therapy if needed, and diet therapy also. But since medications remain to be the cornerstone of the management, and since patients have a lot of questions about the optimal use of medications for management of psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, I have prepared a short video which is a quick overview of all the names of the medications and all the families of those medications that physicians are using now as of 2022 in the management of psoriatic arthritis and skin psoriasis. It will be the next video to be published here on my YouTube channel. Please, if you have not subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe now. Press the subscribe button and the notifications bell. We are always publishing new videos that will help you a lot if you have arthritis. Thank you so much.